Okay, this is chapter 10 of the Night Singer. 10. Sorry, but we have, but do we have a surname for this Axel? Asked Eric. Sandstein, Hannah told him. Eric knew who Eric Sandstein was. He ran a consultancy that helped various businesses streamline their operations. Just a few months earlier, he had won an accolade of some kind at the council's business award ceremony. Axel isn't who people think he is, said Rebecca. I always thought he was a bully, Hannah chipped in. Yeah, that was obvious. Yeah, that was obvious, Rebecca smiled, though it quickly faded. Eric hovered in the background as the women talked. It was clear that Hannah and Rebecca had been close at one point in time. His new colleague seemed much softer than she had earlier, and he doubted he would have, he would have been able to question Rebecca without her present, not considering the way she, she had reacted when she found out her son was dead. For a few minutes, she had been completely unreachable. Was the pregnancy... Hannah paused. No, he didn't rape me, said Hannah. We were together. When did that happen? asked Hannah. A few weeks before graduation. I was worried what you would think, and then other things got in the way. I never managed to tell you before you left. A flash of guilt passed over Hannah's face, though Rebecca didn't seem to have noticed. She was too hung up on the past. I didn't realize I was pregnant. I thought it was all the drinking that made me feel sick constantly. And even though I'd started to work out what Axel was like, I wanted to keep the baby. And and I wanted to try. Rebecca was overwhelmed by such a powerful sobbing fit that she couldn't speak. She pressed her clenched fist to her stomach and Hannah embraced her again. Eric managed to find the kitchen and got a glass of water and a paper towel. On the way back, he almost tripped over a cuddly gray rabbit. He put down the glass of water on the coffee table and handed a sheet of, pa a sheet of paper towel to Hannah, who passed it to Rebecca. We lived with Axel's parents at first, Rebecca said, blowing her nose. And then when Joel was a few months old, they bought us an apartment. I guess they were sick of all the screaming. Joel had colic and was barely sleeping at night. But Axel got much worse when it was just the three of us. What did he do? asked Hannah. He was just so jealous. How did he show that? By checking my phone, telling me who I couldn't and couldn't see. That kind of thing. And he hit me too. Rebecca was clutching the paper towel so tight that it had begun to fall apart in her hands. But I still didn't want to give up. Joel was four when I finally decided I had enough and moved back to Oland. Eric waited for one of the women to go on, but both simply stared straight ahead. Rebecca at the paper towel and Hannah at Rebecca. So what kind of relationship did you have once you left Axel? Rebecca looked up at Eric as though she had only just realized he was in the room. He threatened me. I was staying with my mom, and he said he'd burn down the house with us in it if I didn't come back. Hannah tensed. Sorry, said Rebecca, but that's what he said. Eric didn't understand what she meant. And how was this Axel with Joel? He asked. Rebecca wiped away the tears silently rolling down her cheeks. He was a bastard with him, too. Hannah looked down at the table. It was impossible to tell what was going through her mind. In what sense? Eric pressed. He put such impossible demands on him. Like when Joel was five, he locked him in his room because he couldn't tie his shoelaces. Joel was a complete wreck when he got home. I had to coax what happened out of him. So he lived with his dad as well? Only at first. I never knew my dad, so I hoped Axel would change. But in the end, it just wasn't working. I realized he wasn't good for Joel. Did Axel, did Axel hit him too? Hannah asked. Only once. That I saw anyway. Rebecca was still clutching the ragged piece of paper towel. What is it? Hannah asked. I had to threaten Axel with sole custody. I said I'd tell them everything he'd done to me if he didn't agree. He didn't like that. He kept harassing you? Hannah asked. Yeah. But why would he kill Joel? Eric spoke up. To punish me, maybe? Said Rebecca. Or maybe he just lost his temper. That used to happen a lot. Eric pictured the boy's bloodied body. Joel was found in the rest of Monkel Mo in the rest area in Monkelmosen, said Hannah. What do you make of that? I don't understand it, Rebecca sobbed. There's nothing out there. Eric got up. He knew there might be things Rebecca would only say if she was alone with Hannah. He nodded towards the door, letting them know he was going out for a while. Forensics, Hannah mocked to him. On the out on the porch, Eric called Ove to arrange for forensics to come to the house and to let him know they would have to look into Axel Sandstein. Ove didn't sound happy with the news. The Kalmar police had used Sandstein's firm on a number of occasions. 
On top of that, the news that a dead teenager had been found in the middle of the Alvar was already being shared on the Olin forum on Facebook, including the exact location, though fortunately no names had been mentioned. Ove had, find, had found out when a journalist from Barrow Metern called and started asking questions. After a moment's hesitation, Eric told Ove that Hannah had gone to school with the victim's mother. He ended the call and turned around. There was no sign of forced entry on the, door, on the front door, but the technicians would still have to check the house for any evidence of a break-in. Perhaps people around here didn't even bother locking their doors, Eric thought. Either way, the most likely explanation was that Joel had left the house himself. Abducting a teenager against his will was not something that could be done quietly, not even a teenager as small as Joel. Maybe he had agreed to meet Axel Stanston or someone else. They were still at the very start of their investigation. They couldn't allow their focus to narrow too much. Er walked down the steps at the front of the house. There was another smaller building and he peered in through one of the windows. It seemed to be a studio of some kind. He could see a potter's wheel in one corner, the shelves around it full of ceramics. He moved to the right and looked into another room, an empty easel and a number of canvases stacked against the wall facing away from him. Eric walked around the edge of the main house. To one side, there was a swing set and a broken slide, an empty sand pit. There was a seating area to the rear, but the view wasn't at all what had been what he had been expecting. The fields never seemed far away in Oland, yet from where he was standing, all he could see were trees. Through them, he could make out more houses. He and Supriya had bought Nilla, had brought Nilla to Oland for the first time last summer, driving up the Boda to go swimming. The beaches were there were fantastic, the shallow water too, but he preferred this kind of landscape. This was precisely the kind of place he would like to live, in a clearing in the woods like people had for thousands of years. Sorry, who are you? A man was peering over at him from the neighboring garden, probably the same neighbor who had just turned 40, given how hungover he looked. Eric walked over and introduced himself. The man's name was Gabriel Anderson, he learned. Did you know? Did you have the Forland family over for a barbecue yesterday evening? Eric asked him. Yes, we did. After a brief pause, Gabriel added, Why are you here? I'm afraid I can't say, but I'd like to know if anything unusual happened during the barbecue. No, I, I mean, like, what? I don't know, that's why I'm asking. No, we just ate and talked and drank. And the kids? They ran off inside first chance they got. Did you notice anything strange about Joel? No. Gabriel seemed to hesitate again, and Eric smiled, but he didn't go on. Sorry, I have to go and deal with the laundry, the neighbor said, excusing himself.